Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We are now coming to a new setting in our continuing study of the Gospel of Luke. The last section of Luke's narrative seems to go from the beginning of chapter 15 on through verse 10 of chapter 17. A lot of ground was covered during this event that began with Jesus teaching some tax collectors and sinners. Then there were the times when the Lord was teaching his disciples while some Pharisees were listening in. They began sneering at Jesus and mocking him over his teaching against their love of money and dead religion. The Lord responded with some confrontational preaching that must have made those hypocrites very uncomfortable. This teaching event comes to an end after the disciples asked Jesus to increase their faith. The Lord responded with two parables, the final one being on the extremely important issue of obedience. How can we have greater faith in God until we are willing to believe all His promises to such a point that we will obey His commands? You know what an armchair athlete is, but do you know what an armchair Christian is? Armchair athletes are people who are often rather pudgy and out of shape. They yell and scream at the ball players and point out all their mistakes and failures. Yet not one of them are willing to face off with those 300-pound muscular linemen. If they did, they'd get run over like a freight train and have to be scraped out the field like some smushed cartoon character. They are all words with no action. I've talked to many people that claim that they had great faith, but you never see any proof of it in their life. They are armchair Christians that complain against the pastor and scream and shout at what the church should be doing, while they are doing nothing but causing trouble and wearing out the pastor. Faith is an action word that produces results. Proof of true faith begins with a Christ-like character. All kinds of people can boast about how they are a good Christian, but their character is far more Satan-like than anything else. Just look at their marriage and you will see what I mean. A Christ-like character is filled with love and compassion, first to family, then to their local church, and then for a perishing world. Take a brief look at the prayer life of those who grumble and complain. It's virtually non-existent. During my 17 years of pastoral ministry, I have had some nightmare board members, and I have found later that every one of them were prayerless. They acted out of the flesh, not through the Spirit. At times they were even led by devils when you look at all the damage that they did. To talk about all the ills within the church while refusing to be part of the remedy is detrimental to the kingdom of God. It only advances the kingdom of hell. Have you ever noticed how it's easier to be part of the problem instead of being part of the solution? The only way we can be part of the solution in the church and the world is by living out a biblical faith as proved by a holy life that comes out of deep abiding relationship with Jesus. This is the kind of faith that turns the world upside down for the glory of God. We are in desperate need of men and women of action who are full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Beginning in verse 11, we find a wonderful story where Jesus heals ten lepers. I love this story and have preached many sermons from these verses. Verse 11 sets the stage for this historical event. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. This is very similar to what Luke wrote in chapter 9, verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. The big difference between these two accounts is that in chapter 9, Jesus sent messengers ahead of him to prepare for a time of ministry among the Samaritans, while in chapter 17, Jesus passes them by. From chapter 9, we learn that Jesus began heading towards Jerusalem to be offered up as the Lamb of God, and in chapter 17, he is getting closer to that fateful day. One reason why Jesus passed by Samaritan territory is that the Samaritans would be violent against any Jews heading to Jerusalem for one of the feasts. I have touched on the deep-rooted animosity between the Jews and Samaritans, so I'm not going to go over that right now. Verses 12 and 13 give us some more information on the event, stating, As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. According to Jewish law, lepers couldn't enter villages or cities and had to keep a distance away from people so that they didn't spread the contagious disease. 
We don't know if they purposely met Jesus or just happened to be there as he was heading towards Jerusalem. At this point in our Lord's ministry, he had been preaching in the villages of Galilee, so this must have been one as well. According to the requirements of the law, lepers kept their distance from Jesus and the disciples, and they cried out to the Lord to have mercy on them. This reveals that they knew who Jesus was, and this makes me think that they had been looking for Jesus rather than merely stumbling upon him. They spoke the right words to the Savior, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Those aren't magical words as if, when spoken, that the Lord must respond in a particular way. We can trust the nature of God as revealed in Scripture, and it's a consistent reality that He compassionately responds to those who cry out to Him for mercy. The Greek word translated here as mercy means to have compassion, to take pity, or to show mercy. Some translations use pity, while others use mercy, and a couple chose compassion. They are all saying the same thing as it relates to the cry of the ten lepers. There's a point I want to make that at first may seem frivolous, but it's actually very important. All ten lepers knew that they were lepers. They knew their disease had exiled them from family, friends, the people of Israel, and even from God. Lepers lived with other lepers, and they knew they were all lepers. Leprosy has a spiritual correlation. It's a symbol of sin and what sin does to people. First it alienates people from God, and then it begins to alienate people from each other. Those who are in the practice of sin hang with those who practice the same sins, just like lepers lived with other lepers, otherwise they were forced to live in solitude. My wife was talking to a church secretary in Florida who referred to Florida as an elephant graveyard where elephants go to die, but she was using this in reference to the number of elderly people that go there to die. She mentioned one woman who hadn't been visited by family or friends for over 15 years. Just like leprosy, sin separates people from everything that's good and leaves them slowly dying in their sin. The sad thing is that most spiritual lepers don't realize they have that terrible spiritual malady that kills people 100% of the time. There is a remedy to the spiritual malady of sin, but there's only one doctor who can cure this terminal disease, and the fee is so high that it will cost them everything they have and everything they are. To get the treatment, dying patients must fully agree to the terms and conditions of the treatment set by the doctor, and to veer from these requirements will cause the problem to come back with a vengeance. Ten lepers heard that a specialist in healing leprosy was coming to town, so they waited outside of the village until Dr. Jesus showed up. One of the requirements to receive the cure is to know you have leprosy, and another is to want to be cured of it according to the remedy that Dr. Jesus gives. What does Dr. Jesus require? That we become beggars, that cry out to him for mercy, and this is what the ten lepers did. The cure is so costly that it will only be administered to those who really want the cure no matter the cost. This is why those who need Dr. Jesus' healing power must become desperate enough to cry out for mercy. Our pride is so deeply rooted in us that we won't cry to God for mercy unless we come to the place of desperation, and even then most of mankind rejects a cure. When the cry for mercy is genuine, the Lord is sure to respond, not because He has to, but because that's His nature, which He has revealed to us through Scripture. We are told in verse 14, when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus, who is God incarnate, is filled with compassion for every leper and for every spiritual leper. Spiritual and moral leprosy takes in all of mankind. The Lord wanted to heal those ten lepers, but they had to meet the conditions that are necessary for him to perform such miracles. First, they saw they were lepers in need of healing. Next, they wanted to be healed. Third, they were willing to go to the only one who can heal them. And finally, they cried out to the great physician for mercy. This brought about Christ's loving response, Go show yourselves to the priests. There are two important points to this command. The first was faith, and the second was obedience. There is no such thing as faith without obedience. Demons believe in Jesus more than we do, but they refuse to obey the Lord, which means that they don't have faith in Him. Faith is to trust God, not merely to believe in His existence. Demons know that God exists, 
and that he's all-powerful, but they refuse to trust him. For us humans, there can't be true faith without obedience, and when there's no obedience, there is sure evidence of no faith. The faith expressed by the ten lepers began with their cry for mercy, but Jesus was demanding something more of them. They needed to obey the command even before they saw any evidence of a miracle. I want to take a moment to summarize what Christ's extraordinary command reveals. In Jesus' day, if something came upon your skin, you had to go to a priest at the temple to be examined. If it was determined that you had leprosy, then you were declared unclean. From that moment, you were separated from family, friends, occupation, and the worship of God. You were forced to live separate from your family and friends, so that the contagious disease didn't spread. You were forbidden to go into cities and villages. When you came across people, you had to cry out, unclean, unclean, so that they would keep their distance from you. Once you were diagnosed with the disease, you became like the living dead and knew the disease would eventually kill you. This is a slow, agonizing process that produced feelings of loneliness, alienation, and hopelessness. If you are cured of this incurable disease, the Mosaic Law commands you to go to the temple and be examined once again. If you are declared clean, then you had to make some prescribed offerings, and then you were restored to your family and village. There were two lepers in the Old Testament that were supernaturally healed. The first was Moses' sister that rebelled against her brother, and the Lord smote her with leprosy for a week. The second is Naaman, who was commander of the army of Aram. This happened during the time of Elijah the prophet, and the account is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. After Naaman was healed, he didn't obey what the law commanded because he wasn't a Jew. Miriam didn't do what was required either because the leprosy was an act of discipline for her rebellion against the man of God and only lasted for a short time. This reveals that the law concerning lepers being healed was actually prophetic since they were never used until Jesus began healing lepers. For Jesus sent the ten lepers to the temple after they were healed must have caused a huge ruckus in the temple because the priests were predominantly hostile to Jesus. Now we come to a point of faith, and this is very important. True faith produces obedience, and this is why faith is an action word, for there must be an act of obedience for faith to work. The ten lepers acted by faith and began heading to the temple in Jerusalem. They did this while all the signs of the disease were still upon their bodies. Since there were ten lepers, I imagine that disease was at various stages upon the men, from that which was only beginning to that which was advanced. Now we come to the point in verse 14, and as they went they were cleansed. They weren't healed as they stood talking with Jesus. No, they were healed as they went in faith by taking Jesus at his word. If they wouldn't have obeyed the command to go, then they wouldn't have been healed. Jesus required of them simple obedience, and then he would do all the rest. We aren't told how far they traveled before they were healed, but it had to be far enough for their act to be an expression of faith. Now imagine what happened when they were healed. One of the characteristics of leprosy is that it destroys the extremities of the body while killing the nervous system. Advanced stages of the disease leaves people without a nose or ears or fingers or toes. I think when Jesus healed them, not only did the disease totally leave their bodies, but those body parts that were missing were restored and their skin was made new. I don't know what that would feel like to have a nose pop out of your face or ears to pop out of the side of your head, but it had to be one wild experience. Then came the dancing, jumping, screaming, and hugging. Joy would have filled their hearts that had been beat down with hopelessness ever since they were diagnosed with that terrible disease. After all the hootin' and hollerin' was over, they joyfully began heading to the temple. Their separation and alienation were at an end. They could be reconciled to their family, friends, village, and yes, back to God. Something happens after this that teaches us a very powerful truth, and we read this in verses 15 and 16. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Ten lepers asked Jesus to have mercy on them, which was a cry for him to heal them. All ten were healed, because all ten responded in faith to Jesus' command by heading to the temple. I would venture to say that all ten greatly rejoiced over their healing, since their lives had just been radically changed. Yet only one returned to give Jesus thanks, 
the rest went on their way to enjoy their new life without Jesus. Nine lepers wanted Jesus to heal them, but they didn't want Jesus. The desire for God to heal us isn't wrong unless the reason we want to be healed is selfish or evil. Jesus responded with mercy to their request for mercy. They wanted Jesus to do for them what they couldn't do for themselves, but they didn't want Jesus. They only wanted what he could do for them. But one leper was different. Like the rest, he wanted Jesus to heal him, but he also wanted Jesus. And the difference between the one leper and the nine is humongous. This former leper was different, though he wanted to be healed of his leprosy. He also craved fellowship with Jesus, and this is why he returned to give Jesus thanks for performing such an astounding miracle in his life. Now, there's a spiritual principle that I want to share that's simple, yet radical, when rightly applied to the life. Of the ten lepers, nine made Jesus a means to a selfish end. What was that end? Personal happiness. Let me define how I'm using the words means and end. The means is the way we obtain a desire or principle love, and the end is the prize we seek, which is our desire or principle love. A man that wants to be a multimillionaire will use business and investments to make those millions. The end the man is seeking is to become a multimillionaire. The way the man gains those millions is the means. To nine lepers, the end or prize they wanted was a happy life that was free from the misery of their leprosy. The means to get that prize was Jesus. Nine lepers were only using Jesus to get what they wanted, which was the idle happiness. I imagine that most of my listeners have at some time in their life been taken advantage of, where someone used you and you felt the wrong of it. Maybe you lent someone money and they never paid you back, or you tried to help someone through a difficult time and then that person stabbed you in the back. To be selfishly used hurts. Yet this is exactly what nine of the ten lepers did to Jesus. They selfishly used him so that they could run after the idle happiness. I would venture to say that the idle happiness was rooted in their life before they caught that contagious disease. As I pondered on this event, the thought came to me that Jesus was willing to be used by nine lepers so that he could rescue the one who wanted more than his body to be healed. To the one leper, Jesus was the means to his healing and the end that he was seeking for his whole life. The one leper wanted Jesus to heal him, and like I said earlier, that's not a wrong desire unless the motive for the healing is evil. But deep down inside, this man had a spiritual thirst, though he didn't understand this ache that was burning inside of him. Jesus knew this and was seeking after a lost sheep. He was pulling upon a slender thread of spiritual desire that hadn't even been awakened yet. This leper's healing broke open the flood waters of a desire after God that he didn't even know was growing inside of him. Jesus became the means to the end, and the end itself. In other words, he was using Jesus to get to Jesus, and that's a good thing. The Lord is a prize that we are to seek, and he is the only one that can help us gain the prize that's beyond our natural reach. When we really want Jesus, when we really want deep abiding fellowship with him, then he will become the means to help us obtain the greatest of all prizes and the greatest of all treasures, which is himself. An added wonder of this account is that nine of the ten lepers were Jews. The only one that returned to Jesus to give him thanks was a Samaritan who was hated by the Jews and who hated Jews. Those lepers that were Jews should have been the first to run back to Jesus but they didn't because their religion blinded them to their true spiritual need. Samaritans rejected the Jewish Bible and temple worship, yet it was a Samaritan that returned to the Jewish Messiah to throw himself at his feet and worship. He didn't run up to shake Jesus' hand or to give him a big hug. He threw himself down at Jesus' feet, and in that position of adoration thanked the only one who could heal him of that disease. This act of thankful adoration was so thoroughly genuine that Jesus responded in verse 19 saying, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. There's a point here that we need to lay hold of. All ten lepers were physically healed, and all ten would show themselves to the priests in Herod's temple and be declared clean. 
They would then be allowed to go home to their family and return to the normal life without all the loneliness, pain, and fear. Yet nine healed lepers didn't go back to Jesus to thank him. They went on to enjoy the gift of God without God being part of their lives. Because the nine didn't return to give Jesus thanks doesn't mean the leprosy came back upon them. They were all physically healed on the outside, but they weren't transformed on the inside. They left Jesus without being changed on the inside. In verse 19, Jesus says, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. Young's literal translation reads, Thy faith has saved thee. The Greek sentence is more accurately translated as, Your faith has saved you or delivered you. The faith of ten lepers healed them all physically. Nine of the lepers were changed only on the outside. The one leper that returned to give Jesus thanks was healed in body and soul. He was saved. What we see here exposes a huge problem in the church. A vast number of self-professing Christians only want Jesus for what he can do for them. They don't want Jesus. How few it is that truly want Jesus, that want him without any stipulations or conditions. Jacob was the son of Isaac and grandson of Abraham. In his life's drama, there's a point when he finally heads back home. Yet he's afraid to see his brother Esau's response because of how he deceived him out of the inheritance that belongs to the eldest son. Before they met, Jacob wrestled with God through the night, and we are told in Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 through 22, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking, and will give me food to eat, and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. Of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Actually, this is a very selfish prayer. It contains stipulations and conditions to serving God. The Lord tolerated this selfish prayer because it was the best that Jacob could offer at that point in his life. The prayer or liturgical song of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, is much better. Let me read it to you. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. What a phenomenal prayer and declaration. This is a biblical way of thinking, where the victorious Christian life is lived out. From this account of Jesus healing the ten lepers, we should take a little time and look at the problem of being double-minded that's revealed in this account. Double-mindedness is much more common than what we might think. When you go to a restaurant and they have a huge menu, it's easy to be double-minded. Do I want breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Do I want beef, chicken, or pork? And so on. To be double-minded over our choice of what we eat isn't sin. But it is sin when it comes to our faith and walk with God. James confronted this issue in his epistle in chapter 4, verse 8, writing, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. To draw near to God is the prize of all human existence. But to do this, we must become single-minded. Single-mindedness is a condition that God established for us to draw near to Him and for Him to draw near to us. This wasn't the church's idea. To be single-minded, we must have one consuming love, one consuming desire, and this can only be Jesus. To do otherwise would make us idolaters. The Lord must be our supreme love, where it's as if we hated others in comparison to our love for the Savior. This can happen only through single-minded devotion to God. This doesn't come to us naturally because we are naturally predisposed to double-mindedness. Before we can overcome double-mindedness, we must understand how it works in our life and then begin to deal with it through repentance and persistent prayer. Our propensity to double-mindedness can even affect our repentance, where we try to get right with Jesus for all the wrong reasons. People can ask God to heal a marriage, which sounds good, but if the motive is wrong, then the repentance is also wrong. Let me explain myself by using an example of marriage. It's not hard in our day to imagine a marriage that's falling apart, 
It's all too common. The husband and wife may pray that God would restore the marriage, but they do this because they aren't happy, and they believe the lie that they deserve to be happy. Their motive is wrong, because they are being double-minded. They know that they should love and forgive each other because that's what God's Word teaches. Yet they have been defined by the worldly philosophical lie that a reason for being is to live a happy life. They are like the nine lepers that wanted Jesus to heal them, but didn't want Jesus. Double-mindedness can infect every area of life. I knew a pastor that was going through a terrible ordeal of having a son that was diagnosed with leukemia. I hadn't seen him for a few years, but he and his wife showed up at a church where I was ministering. That's when I learned about the condition of their son. The wife told us a sad story of how they virtually lived for six months in the hospital. She said it was the worst year of her life and the hardest year of her marriage. Then she commented on how they begged God to heal their son and repented of anything that they could imagine in their life so that the Lord would heal their boy. I didn't comment on this since the pain of their ordeal was still very raw. I'm glad to say that their son lived. Now here's the point of this story. They didn't repent because they wanted to be in right fellowship with God, but they wanted God to heal their son. I'm not saying this to condemn them, because as I have meditated on this issue and their situation, I can't say that I would do anything different. It's a very difficult position for parents to be in to watch their child suffer and possibly die. Yet our repentance should be for one reason. Sin has separated us from God and hid His glorious face, and our repentance should be for the reconciling of our relationship with Jesus. The more we love Jesus, the more our repentance will be done with a right motive that's free from double-mindedness. Let me be transparent here. Ministers can repent from sin not to have Jesus, but so they don't lose their ministry or so they have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is duplicity of mind and heart as well. Jesus will not silently watch us act like the nine unthankful lepers that went off to enjoy their new life without Jesus. The Lord will not let another end than himself satisfy us. Jesus gave us the remedy to our duplicity in verses 9 through 11, pronouncing, Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Pride, self-will, and duplicity keeps us from drawing near to God. The prize of salvation and of eternal life is fellowship with the living God. The remedy to our double-mindedness is repentance, which is a gift from God. We are to repent to have Jesus because sin has veiled his lovely face. When we finally come to the place where we must have Jesus no matter the cost, then repentance will be seen as the wonderful gift that it is. Robert Robinson was saved under the powerful preaching of George Whitfield. He wrote the famous hymn, Come thou fount of every blessing. The first verse reads, Come thou fount of every blessing, Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Sadly, Robinson backslid. Years later, he was traveling in a stagecoach and was sitting next to a young woman who was deeply fascinated by a book she was reading. When she came across a lyric that she considered especially beautiful, she read it to Robinson, and then asked his opinion on it. This is what she read. O to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Robinson broke down weeping and replied, Madam, I am the poor and happy man who wrote that hymn many years ago, and I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings I had then. This encounter brought Robinson back to Jesus, where he found deliverance from his duplicity. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihpministry.com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more, so come wash in the river. Come
come drink your fill Let healing warm 